Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about energy budget. Energy budget is a concept that I like to use to illustrate the importance of balancing your training with your recovery. And although it's a little abstract, at the same time it's nothing too complicated for you to be able to follow. Let's first talk about a regular household budget. Let's say I have $100 to feed myself for a week. And although this is not enough for me to be going out to clubs and popping bottles, if I was acting responsibly, I will probably be able to manage. So let's say I have some potatoes, some bread, some pasta, some milk and eggs, some canned tuna, and maybe even a few protein shakes after my workouts. So nothing too fancy, but at the same time I wouldn't be starving. Now let's imagine that this money is an equivalent of the energy I get to spend at the gym. Let's see how much I have. Let's say I have four solid meals a day, try to get my eight hours of sleep, my job is not too taxing, maybe some kind of desk job, and my life overall is not too stressful because let's imagine for the purpose of this imaginary discussion that I didn't have any kids. So I have 100 units of energy to spend at the gym. So how to go about it? As you might remember from the previous episode, we talked about the fact that at the end of the day, we always manage limited resources. And we were making comparison of face pulls versus bend over rows. Let's imagine that I wanted to invest $20 and face pull bank was offering me 5% interest rate while bend over rows bank was offering me 10%. With all the other things being equal, there is really no logical reason for me to invest my $20 into face pool bank. Because even though 5% and 10% might not seem like a big difference, over a period of years or even decades, the amount of dividends that I would collect would be much, much different. And that's really what specificity is all about. It's about selecting the most effective tools to get the most out of your training. So what are we going to do with these 100 units of my energy? What is the most effective exercise for legs? Squat. What about chest? Barbell press. What about shoulders? Shoulder press. Back? Deadlift. Now we still have a little bit left, so maybe a little bit of pull-ups and dips. Again, nothing too fancy, but for the most part, we covered all the bases. Now let's imagine that I lost my mind and decided to have kids. Not as much sleep, maybe a little more stress in my life. Looks like we're going to have to make an adjustment. Are we going to throw out back squat? No, because that's the only leg exercise that we have in the program. The same goes for bench press, the same goes for shoulder press. What about deadlift? Maybe we can start alternating deadlift with bent over rows to get lads some more direct work. So from month to month, for example. And we're going to be discussing such strategies in one of the following episodes. Now, does this mean that I always have to train within my means? I think in 21st century, we're all familiar with such thing as credit card. And an equivalent of credit card when it comes to training would be overreaching. Overreaching is when I purposely train a little harder than I can recover from because I plan to pay that energy debt back at some point. For example, let's say I'm planning to go on vacation with my family for a week. And I know that during that week there won't be too much serious training going on. At most some kind of deload level of training. So it would actually be wise for me to train a little harder during the last few weeks prior to that vacation because I know that I would be able to recover from it during the following week of rest. Now what happens when you're constantly maxing out your credit cards without staying on top of your bills? Your credit cards get cancelled. The collection agency might be coming knocking on your door. And at some point you might actually have to declare bankruptcy. And in the context of training, an equivalent of bankruptcy would be overtraining. And as we said before, this is when you constantly training outside of your means without properly balancing out your training with your recovery. Now let's see what things would look like for a professional bodybuilder. Eight meals a day, properly spaced out, 10 hours of sleep, maybe a nap during the day, no job, and of course, steroids. And just like it would be much easier for me to feed myself for a week if I had $500 
versus 100. It is much easier to create a training program when you can afford this much more training. So let's say six training sessions a week, no problem. Some fasted cardio before breakfast, no problem. When I emphasize my shoulders, maybe start training them twice a week, no problem. Superset, drop sets, what have you. And since you can cram more training into your schedule this way, the rate of the progress for a professional bodybuilder is much, much faster. Versus for the rest of us, we have to be a little more patient and be a little more clever with how we manage our resources. And this is why I always say that for an average person to try to copy a training program of uh, some Mr. Olympia, it's very much the same as for someone who earns minimum wage to try to imitate the lifestyle of Bill Gates. Now that you understand the concept of energy budget, let's discuss some of the factors that will either increase or decrease the amount of energy available to you during training sessions. And we mentioned some of these already, like diet for example. Diet is by far the most important factor that will affect how much training you can recover from. And as you can see, things can go both ways here. And a lot of it will have to do with how much food you can afford financially. But some of it will also have to do with how diligent you are. Because whatever the amount of food you can afford can be eaten over two meals a day, or it could be spread out over five meals, which is obviously more beneficial because you're constantly providing a supply of nutrients and energy to your muscles throughout the day. The second most important factor that will affect your recovery is sleep. And just like with the diet, sleep is a double-edged sword. And a lot of it, once again, will have to do with your life circumstances. For example, as I said before, if you just had a newborn baby, you're probably not getting that much sleep and there is not much you can do about it. But if you're staying up every night scrolling through your phone for a couple of hours, you're probably not being as good with your sleep as you could. Now we're going to be discussing some things that would only take away from your training. And number one on this list is your job. It should be pretty obvious that the more physically challenging your job is, the less energy you will have for your training at the end of the day. Number two on this list is stress. And stress is just part of life. A lot of it will have to do with how you manage stress. But I'm sure I don't have to explain to you that, let's say if you have legal trouble and you're in court every day, you probably won't be getting the most out of your training during that time. The last one here is sports, which we will say is any exercising outside of lifting weights. And once again, it should be obvious that the more energy you put into this, the less energy you will have for your strength training. For example, when I was doing jujitsu five days a week, I only had one strength training session on Saturday. And even that wasn't very aggressive because I just didn't have that much left in the bank by the end of the week. We are now getting to GPP, general physical preparation. Back in the 90s, I used to follow training recommendations of Stuart McRobert, who advocated for two or three very short training sessions a week. And since I considered myself genetically average, I thought that that was the best I could do. In 2001, I joined the military, and for the following few years, almost every day I had either very long run or very long hike. When I was discharged from the military and was finally able to get back to training, all of a sudden two or three sessions a week felt like a joke. And now I could train three or four times a week and my sessions were actually even longer. And that's when I started to realize that your workload capacity is not predetermined so much by your genetics, but could actually be trained. And that's what GPP training is all about. And this is something that is probably being overlooked by most of the literature. And the only book that covers it in a sufficient extent is Book of Methods by Louis Simmons. Louis Simmons recommends multiple short GPP style training sessions throughout the week. But that could be too much for a drug free athlete. Perhaps a better way to go about it would be by scheduling training periods when you're purposely stepping away from training for size and for strength and focus on becoming a well rounded athlete. Because let's be honest, guys. If all you ever do is trying to get big and strong, your endurance probably sucks. And that's why your GPP training would most likely be endurance oriented. Some kind of CrossFit style training program would probably be most appropriate. And although you might have to take a step back in strength and size during these phases, 
it would definitely benefit you in the long run because these small increases in workload capacity would add up over years and down the road you would be able to tolerate much more training which would become very very beneficial when you enter the advanced stages of your career and that's why we're gonna give GPP a big thumbs up and just to finish this table we're just gonna say that as you get a little older and your metabolism starts to slow down your ability to recover from training will also start to decline over time and the last one on this list is steroids steroids will definitely increase your ability to take a beating at the gym but that's not what we're all about on this channel and the only reason I even mention it is because this is something that you have to take into account when you compare your training program to a training program of Ronnie Coleman for example since we are on the topic of recovery let's talk a little bit about some of the modalities that are often being utilized to speed things up so to speak and some of it might be controversial and I will explain why in a minute so the first group I listed here has stretching, massage and heat so hopefully stretching is pretty self-explanatory massage would include any kind of soft tissue mobilization work it could be professional deep tissue massage or something as simple as foam rolling heat can vary quite a bit also so it could be sauna, hot bath or hot shower and as I said, there's a lot of discussion on the effectiveness of these and I think the confusion is coming from the fact that people are looking into extreme applications. For example, people say, well, if you sit in a sauna for an hour, you will get dehydrated and it will probably be counterproductive. Well, who said you have to sit in a sauna for an hour? How about if you are really, really sore, you just take a five minute hot shower to loosen up a bit. And then if you packs are especially sore maybe you can massage them a little bit for a minute and then grab onto something and maybe stretch for another minute and then you do the same for for the other side and that's all you really have to do and there is really no doubt that that would help your recovery and that's why I'm gonna give all of these thumbs up the second group I listed here includes cryotherapy, copping and scraping and these seem to be getting more and more popular lately and I think it's because people are just curious to know what it's all about but do understand that at this point we simply don't know enough to make a statement whether or not any of this actually helps and that's why I'm gonna give all three of these question mark to finish this episode I wanna say a few words about MRV maximum recoverable volume Although, as a concept, MRV is very similar to energy budget, I personally don't use it for two reasons. Number one is, it seems to be easier for people to connect the dots when I say energy budget. There seems to be a trend in the fitness community these days to gravitate towards complicating things. You watch a YouTube video and it's all MRV, RPE, mesocycle, macrocycle, and you can't help wondering if outside of a very limited number of people anyone even knows what's being discussed and from what I've seen for people new to training none of it is intuitive at all and that's in fact why I use all these various analogies when I explain different aspects of training the second reason why I don't use MRV is because it implies a particular number and I just think there are too many variables for us to be able to make such claims for example, are we talking about Dorian Yates blood and gut sets or are we talking about Lee Haney stimulate do not annihilate sets? Or let's say MRV for my deltoids is 12 sets. I still have to take into account that it would be very much affected by how hard my previous chest session was. So what I'm saying is there seems to be too many variables for us to be able to state that we can sit down and use some kind of algorithm to calculate a particular number of sets for different body parts and that's why I don't use MRV although as I said before it is a very similar concept to an energy budget but that's it for this installment and I'll see you guys next time